Hi everyone. The modern world has long since entered the era of high technology. Many of us witnessed the birth of mobile phones and personal computers which for today's generation, and really for everyone, are now just everyday things. But not so long ago, the things we use today were considered impossible, straight out of science fiction. Just one neural network is enough to blow the mind of even someone who understands technology. Many claim that 2025 was a turning point. The beta generation has already been born, a generation that has been digitalized from birth. A generation for whom artificial intelligence is a part of themselves. To them, we will seem like people from the Middle Ages. And most likely, they won't have any other life except a life with AI. And it's true, those of us from the 90s generation who saw how it all began, how button phones appeared and then smartphones, how we used to run around internet cafes searching for knowledge and more, how neural networks emerged and what Skynet could do, it all gets a little scary. Imagine a world where you're connected to an all-knowing neural network. Why bother learning, why even have an education system at all, if you can get the answer to any question just by thinking about it? Neural implants could make you a genius from birth. There's no need to go through the struggles of learning or the depression during exams. You won't have to retake your driving test over and over because cars will soon be fully autonomous in every sense and the driver will just be dead weight and God forbid if one day they decide that weight is useless. It will be a very interesting but also a depressing world. Reality will be indistinguishable from something synthetically generated. Even the movies we'll watch in the future won't be real. Very soon, planets will change so much that a modern intelligent person won't be able to understand how it all works or how it happened so quickly. Exponential development has begun, and it will lead to only one thing, the singularity, to such a rapid advancement of technology, and especially artificial intelligence, that the very nature of humanity and society will change, making further progress unpredictable. Basically, Inspector Gadget is just around the corner, and we'll actually want it ourselves. At first, it'll just be cool and interesting, but soon we won't be able to live without implanted features and enhancements. But technological development has one important feature. It's impossible without electricity. Everything that's not plugged into an outlet runs on batteries. Gadgets won't be autonomous without batteries, which is why scientists of all kinds are trying to create more efficient chemical power sources. And that's exactly what my story today is about, the batteries of the future. From the perspective of battery development, we live in interesting times. The past, present, and future are all mixed together. Alongside modern lithium power sources, we still use outdated lead ones. Compared to lithium, it's worse in every way except safety. Well, it's obvious that the near future belongs to lithium. Today, my goal is to show you several types of batteries that many of you have never heard of. But maybe these are the very ones that will become the key solution to the problem of autonomy. Lithium batteries are a huge family. Lithium cobalt, manganese, phosphate, iron, titanate, polymer, and another dozen varieties. In your smartphones and other gadgets, lithium polymer batteries are often used. These are probably the most dangerous batteries among lithium ones. Since they don't have safety valves, they swell up and burn so fiercely that even water can't stop them. They have a relatively short lifespan, but in return, they've got a couple of aces up their sleeve. First, they're made as pouches without a hard casing, and they can be made in any shape and size to fit any device. This allows the manufacturer to design the device first, and then order a battery in the required shape. And the second thing, the specific energy density of polymer batteries is 250, and sometimes even around 300 watt-hours per kilogram of weight. And that's a lot. The nominal voltage for most lithium-ion batteries is about 3.7 volts. Lithium batteries can come in different designs. There are a lot of standards, particularly prismatic or cylindrical designs for universal applications. Often, these standard batteries are equipped with safety valves for emergency pressure released to prevent explosions. When it comes to energy storage, you won't find anything better than lithium iron phosphate batteries in terms of longevity, cost, and energy density. They can have a lifespan of 4 to 6,000 cycles, which for the record is more than 10 years. In comparison, classic lithium batteries last about 1,000 cycles. Phosphate is much safer in terms of fire risk and is more resistant to cold and their price in 2020 was lower than that of classic lithium batteries and even specialized gel batteries for off-grid systems. In general, phosphate is used in electric transport, autonomous storage systems, wind and solar power plants, and so on. The downside is the energy density, which ranges from 90 to 150 watt-hours per kilogram, and that's almost half of what good classic lithium batteries offer. 
Also, phosphate batteries have a nominal voltage of 3.2 volts, not 3.7 volts like most others. When fully charged, or at the end of charge voltage, it's 3.6 to 3.65 volts. For regular lithium-ion batteries, this voltage is 4.2 volts. The minimum voltage for phosphate is 2 to 2.5 volts. For classic lithium, it's 2.5 to 3 volts. The vast majority of lithium batteries have one important problem. They can't be charged at sub-zero temperatures. There are some modifications that can handle a few degrees below zero, but overall, charging in the cold is risky. The same goes for discharging. They may still work, but their capacity and output current drop sharply at negative temperatures. This problem is solved by the most expensive member of the lithium family, His Majesty Titanate. Lithium titanate can be charged at minus 30 and discharged down to minus 40. Titanate also has a few more perks. The charge and discharge currents for titanate are enormous. It can be charged with currents 5 to 10 times greater than its own capacity and discharged with currents 20 to 30 times its own capacity. This makes it possible to charge and discharge it extremely quickly with massive currents, and in many industries, current is the key factor. And titanate is also the most durable among lithium batteries. If classic lithium batteries last about 1,000 cycles, and phosphate ones around 6,000, titanate batteries can last over 20,000 cycles, which by the way is nearly 50 years or more. And as a bonus, titanate is considered the safest among lithium batteries. Well, that sounds awesome, you might say. So why aren't we switching to titanate? There are two things that ruin it all. The specific energy density is 300 watt-hours per kilogram or more for classic lithium versus just 60 to 90 watt-hours per kilogram. In the case of titanate, in other words, it's just not energy efficient. For comparison, a lead acid battery, which is one of the worst in terms of energy efficiency, has a specific energy density of 50 to 60 watt-hours per kilogram. So titanate is a much better. The second major drawback is the price of titanate. It's the most expensive battery among all lithium types. For a kilowatt hour of standard lithium, you'll have to pay about $150 to $180. For phosphate, you'll shell out $120 to $150. Bucks. Titanate, on the other hand, will cost you from $300 and up. High quality titanates are even more expensive. The third drawback is its nominal voltage, which is 2.3 volts. When discharged, it's at 1.5 to 1.8 volts. When fully charged, it's 2.7 volts. So, if you need a 12-volt battery, with standard lithium you only need 3 cells connected in series. With phosphate, you just need 4. But with titanate, you'll need 6 cells. Will titanate become the battery of the future? Maybe, yes, if its energy density can be increased by about 3 times or more, but without raising the price. The price itself will naturally drop over time. There was a time when titanate cost almost a thousand bucks per kilowatt hour. For now, titanate has found wide use in electric buses, where lifespan is especially important. And car audio enthusiasts often use them together with powerful subwoofers, since titanate can deliver enormous discharge currents. Lithium itself is quite expensive, and many people are considering alternative solutions. In the 1970s and 80s, the foundations for many modern battery technologies were laid, including sodium ion chemistry. But the first mass-produced sodium ion batteries only appeared after 2020. So this is really the newest thing out there. There's a lot of sodium in nature. And that means batteries using this chemistry are very cheap and will keep getting cheaper right before our eyes. In manufacturing, the cost per kilowatt hour averages from $50 to $80. At retail, it's from $90 to $120. Bucks. And that's cheaper than any other batteries. The lifespan is from 2,000 to 4,000 cycles. And that's almost like phosphate batteries. In terms of safety, it's the same. Almost like phosphate. Charging and discharging temperature. Sodium is frost resistant. It can charge at minus 10 and below, and discharge at minus 20 or even minus 30. Another ASAP sodium sleeve is related to charging current. For classic lithium, the maximum charging current is 2C, meaning twice its own capacity. And charging at that rate shortens its lifespan. Phosphate isn't much better. Its maximum is 2 to 3C. But some sodium batteries can handle charging currents up to 4C, and that's really impressive. In theory, this means charging in 15 minutes, not accounting for efficiency. But of course, the current leader in this parameter is titanate, which can be charged at currents of 5 to 10C and even higher. So for now, sodium seems to have nothing but advantages. Long lifespan, frost resistance, ability to charge at high currents, safety, and very low cost. So is there really no catch? 
There is. There are two. First is the energy density, about 100 to 160 watt hours per kilogram of weight. That's much better than titanate and comparable to phosphate. But sodium is still a long way from classic lithium. The second feature is the voltage range. The nominal voltage is 3 volts, fully charged it's 4 volts, and when discharged it's about 1.5 volts. And that's actually a problem and here's why. Let's say, you need a 12 volt sodium battery for a car. It needs to be 4S just like with phosphate. In that case, the nominal voltage will be exactly 12 volts, which is very good. And when fully charged, it's already 16 volts, which isn't critical either, but some onboard devices with over-voltage protection might easily trigger that protection. But the voltage when discharged will be only 6 volts. Those same onboard devices also have under-voltage protection, usually set at 9 or 10 volts, so as not to completely drain the battery. So, in practice, what happens is your device, say a car stereo or amplifier, will shut off at the lower threshold, but the battery still isn't fully discharged, meaning you're not using all the effective energy of the battery. In a car, this might actually be a plus, but if you use, for example, a 12-volt to 220-volt inverter at home, you'll probably want to use all the effective energy from the battery, and with sodium, that's just not possible. Of course, it would be silly to change everything just for sodium. So, the only option is for sodium to adapt to everything else. Overall, the wide range of operating voltages is a key drawback of sodium. Here's a small table of operating voltages for other types of batteries. And here you can clearly see what I mean. And finally, let's talk about something that could very well become the golden mean and the battery of the future. Please welcome the lithium graphene batteries. Sometimes they're called lithium graphene supercapacitors, but that's just marketing. Graphene has a high energy density. Just like regular lithium batteries, Graphene batteries can have an energy density exceeding 300 watt hours per kilogram, which none of the other options shown could achieve. Graphene can have a lifespan of 8,000 cycles or more, which is even better than phosphate batteries. When discharging in freezing temperatures below minus 20, graphene is much more efficient than regular lithium, since there is no significant drop in delivered capacity. But why stop at minus 20? Graphene can discharge at minus 40 and still deliver about 85% of its effective capacity. What else is there? Charging current. That doesn't scare graphene. That's its key feature. Graphene can be charged with currents up to 5 or even 10 C. So, in theory, it can be charged in 6 to 12 minutes, and that's without significant heating or degradation. The Chinese even announced a concept of a graphene based electric car with an 8 minute charge time. Sounds like science fiction? No, it's technology. You might say it's all advantages. Probably this stuff is expensive. Not exactly. Starting at 200 bucks per kilowatt hour. That's more expensive than classic lithium, but cheaper than titanate. And it's definitely going to get cheaper. In fact, graphene is like lithium, it's out there on asteroids. It has a more stable anode, lower internal resistance, higher conductivity, is less sensitive to overcharging, and is much safer compared to lithium. They say it can take a nail puncture without catching fire. For this reason, its nominal voltage, just like classic lithium, is 3.7 volts. The charge cutoff voltage is 4.2, and when discharged it's between 2.5 and 2.7. There's just one drawback. Charging at sub-zero temperatures. Zero degrees is the minimum for it. And even then, you have to lower the charging current. But scientists and engineers promise that the new generation of graphene will be able to charge at minus 10, and that's coming very soon. Graphene is actually already being used, even though the first truly large-scale production of such batteries only began in 2021. At the very least, Caterpillar has a line of graphene batteries for power tools. In addition, many companies offer graphene batteries for uninterruptible power supplies and alternative energy systems. Graphene batteries are also used in the aerospace industry. So why aren't they more widespread? It's simply that the technology is too new. And besides, who would benefit if the battery in your smartphone only fails after 15 years? There's no point in that, since in a year or two you'll buy a new smartphone anyway, and the battery in the old one will still be as good as new. So, graphene is beneficial in the long run, but on the other hand, the day after tomorrow a new generation of graphene might come out that's even better and cheaper. Are there any truly awesome energy storage devices out there? Something straight out of science fiction that would blow your mind? How about a power source that can be charged in just one or two seconds? It has a lifespan not of a measly few thousand cycles, but a whole million. 
it can deliver a discharge current of 200 to 300 C, and even up to 1000 C for short bursts. It can be charged and discharged even in freezing temperatures. It's environmentally friendly and safe. This isn't science fiction either, and you already know about it. And if you don't, then get acquainted. The ionister or supercapacitor. It doesn't care about anything. It can melt wrenches and not even flinch. It's not afraid of being discharged to zero, but it does have one, or rather two, very big drawbacks. Those are its specific energy density and high self-discharge. Classic lithium batteries have an energy density of about 300 watt-hours per kilogram, as I mentioned earlier. For ionisters, the regular ones, it's about 6 watt-hours per kilogram, and for the new lithium graphene ionisters, up to 20. And that's still very, very little. And if in the future they're able to raise the energy density of ionisters even to the level of phosphate batteries, they'll be unbeatable, even considering their high cost. For now, they're used where short bursts of massive current are needed. That's pretty much everything I wanted to share today. I hope you learned a lot of new things or at least enjoyed watching the video. Just a reminder, you can support the creator with a like, a subscription, and a kind word or some constructive criticism in the comments. As always, you'll find other useful information in the description. And with that, it's time to say goodbye. As always, this was Kassiana K. With you. See you next time. Bye.